episode is brought to you by Jinx, the superfood-powered dog kibble everyone's been talking about. See the results for yourself and try their one-month transformation. Within the first few weeks, you'll see how Jinx can help with your dog's energy, mood, and even digestion. And it's all thanks to the high-quality ingredients they use, like organic chicken, Atlantic salmon, and grass-fed beef. Try the one-month transformation today. Find Jinx in your local Walmart. Today on CityCast Portland, we're talking about all the trees falling during the storm and how current city codes might work against homeowners. We're also taking a look at a few more city incentives, hoping to breathe some life into downtown, and walking through a new mobile addiction treatment program by Portland Fire and Rescue. Joining me on this week's Friday News Roundup are Willamette Week City Hall reporter Sophie Peel and our very own executive producer, John Atariani. It's Friday, January 26th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Welcome, everyone, to the Friday News Roundup. Sophie, John, thanks for being here. Hello, hello. Yeah, thanks for having us. Today is the day we break down some of the biggest local stories of the week with some of the best and brightest journalists in town. But before we jump in, I like to get us started with an opening question for our guests. Um... In honor of Sophie's recent trip to Mexico, sorry, I'm outing you, I wanted to know what your favorite local Mexican spots were. I'm trying to expand my horizons. Um, There, I don't know the name of it, but there is a little taco food truck if you cross, because our office is on Northwest 23rd, and if you cross sort of like over 405 to more the industrial area, it's a little taco truck, and I have no idea what it's called. Tacos are cheap. Chips are greasy and great. Um, and you can hear construction equipment going on at all hours. So it's like white no. It's like beautiful white noise while you eat tacos. <laughs> it's very peaceful. I feel like that's how you were supposed to eat tacos in America. Like, I don't know what it's called. It's there for the construction workers. It's good. <laughs> nice. What about you, John? Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like the best uh, Mexican food is always sort of like uh, a compromise between like the best and what is closest to you. Right. Um, and so for me, I'm going to go with El Coyote, uh, which is in St. John's and just just kills it. Has great tacos. Um, I've gotten really into their like carne asada fries when I want like a little treat. And it's like a half mile from my house, which helps. Yeah, that place is legit. I love places where you look in and you're like, is that a homeless encampment? And you're like, oh, no, that's a banging taco cart. Do you know what I mean? Because it's just like all tarps and you're like, I don't know what's going on here. Are they allowed to be here? And then you go and you're like, yeah, I'm so glad they're here. A lot of handmade uh, construction at El Coyote as well. Yeah, Yeah. I think it helps. And it's funny because there is like a legit taqueria next to it. And I actually prefer. Oh, same. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, because I also want to represent my hood of St. John's, I wanted to name drop Javelina. John, I don't know if you know this. Uh, no. So Javelina is actually a new chill cocktail bar, but our oh. excellent Mexican food truck, Beto Taqueria, is now running like an ox truck in the back patio. And they're doing a Taco Tuesday special mm-hmm. where for 10 bucks you get this like freshly made citrus margarita, like none of that gross mixed stuff and two delicious street tacos from Betos. And I got to say that the Taco Tuesday street tacos, for some reason, are so much better than the regular tacos. I don't know what they're doing. They're like the smaller ones with like the softer tortillas and they're springier and they're like the ones that you actually get in Mexico. So I'm stoked. Speaking of of Taco Tuesday, did you guys hear about like uh, there was a very white man in like the Midwest who has a Mexican restaurant and he sued Taco Bell over the phrase no. Taco Tuesday, because he said it started with him. He started oh Taco Tuesday. And he settled with ta- he settled with Taco Bell for like an undisclosed amount, but I assume it's a stupid amount of money. But it was just like the funniest. Oh I mean, God. you hear this guy and he has like this very Midwest accent. He's probably 55, 60, very white. And he's suing over the phrase Taco Tuesday saying it started, you know, you know he, he was the starter. It's these two behemoth, like, white-owned, because Taco Bell was also white-owned, uh, 
you know, corporation, small business, like, go for it, buddies. Have fun. Yes, you're inventor of tacos and Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a very enjoyable podcast. I would recommend anyone listen to it. What's it called? Uh, it's it's the journal. It's Wall Street oh, Journal's journal. daily podcast. Yeah, it was probably, I don't know, two or three weeks ago. Oh my gosh, <sighs> that's so great. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> All right, well, on to the news of the week. Sophie, you're bringing in a story you worked on about some of the destruction the trees falling down and the storm caused, right? Yeah, I wrote a story about a family um, in southwest Portland that over two years ago had uh, asked the city for permission to remove two pretty big Douglas firs in their backyard, one of which was sort of leaning a little bit. And they were really worried that during a severe weather event that it would fall on their house and crush it. Um, The city, you know, denied the application saying that the tree is healthy, it's not dying, we don't believe it's dangerous, and it's also over 10 feet away from a structure, which is, seems a little arbitrary because the tree itself is 150 feet tall, (laughs) so it seems like that measurement (laughs) wouldn't really matter. But, um, so the city denied the permit, uh, and the family decided not to appeal the decision, which they could have done for a fee of two hundred dollars. It's probably unlikely they would have won the appeal. Um, and two years later, I mean, l- last week the tree, one of the two Douglas firs, smashed their house, uh, almost killed their six-year-old. Oh um, and then they thought it killed their cat, and then as cats do, reemerged from the nether regions, like. Is wait nether regions? Does that mean? No, that's not what that means. Okay, can I redo that? I was like, no, no, no. The cat did not emerge from the nether regions. It just came out out of everyone's crotch. No, that's not. But you know what? Okay, where where do I restart? Okay, okay, okay. It almost killed their six year old, and it they thought it killed their cat, and then the cat reemerged. You're saying this way too happy, by the way. (laughs) No, I'm trying not to laugh. I just feel so stupid. Everyone's like, she's so happy about this cat. (laughs) Okay, okay, okay. Child almost dying. (laughs) Okay. Um, so, you know, the family is is basically saying, look, we knew this tree was a danger and we tried to get it removed and the city's tree code is so stringent that look what happened. The tree that we were scared about did crush our house and almost killed our daughter and could have killed our cat. We thought it killed mm-hmm. our cat. Um, so, it's it, you know, it's it's one of those situations where like, you know, trees somehow are kind of political in that during really warm weather, trees are really critical to protecting yeah. people, especially who are living outside or those who don't have AC. And then, of course, in severe winter weather and when ice is, you know, kind of like weighing down trees, trees can be killers. So it's kind of this, you know, it's really dependent on the weather and it's kind of a catch-22. Um, the city also has to maintain its tree coverage. I mean, if they allow the tree code to be more flexible. Pretty much anyone could say, you know, I think this tree is a danger. I want to take it down. Someone could say that about like a two foot foot tall sapling. They could take Mm -hmm. that tree down, even though it absolutely is not a danger. So, you know, there is kind of this difficult scenario of the city wanting to protect trees, but also not wanting to get into the situation which they got into last week with, I think, quite a few people that were like, look, I tried to chop down this tree, but you wouldn't let me. And then it crushed my home. So Mm -hmm. it's a Yeah, it's kind of one of those impossible situations. Weren't most of these trees, though, dug firs? Isn't that a bit different than, like, any old tree? You know, like, I have three trees in my property, but they're like fruit trees, and they're not anywhere close. They provide coverage, but I know they're not going to fall because they're, like, deep-rooted. And I'm just learning that dug firs are not deep-rooted. They're kind of length-rooted, and they try to find other trees to intertwine. But if they're, like— I didn't know that. Kind of alone— so that is one interesting thing is that this Doug fir, because this family had an arborist come out after the city denied their permit. They asked an arborist to come out and say, look, should we try to appeal this? The arborist came out and said, look, I don't think you're going to have any luck appealing this decision. However, what I will tell you about Doug firs is that the two you have are really isolated from essentially their pack. Exactly. And so they mm-hmm. don't have sort of that like underground foundation and they are more more vulnerable. And because they are so tall and they're taller than a lot of the other trees, they just get battered by the wind. And so they mm-hmm. are more susceptible to sort of severe weather. Um, but the city, you know, they have a very it, it's interesting if you look at their criteria of how they judge whether to allow one of these removal permits or not. And it's pretty limited. Um, and, you know, it's whether it's dead, dying or dangerous Uh, you know, whether it has like a disease of some sort or is rotting and whether it's within 10 feet of a structure. Other than that, it's pretty much a no-go unless you fit one of those criteria. So they're, they're pretty, they're pretty narrow Mm. and they're pretty stringent about that. 
It's interesting about arborists because I, I went down a bit of a wormhole looking at like recovery trips for when you do have a storm. And something that the Arbor Day Foundation points out is that you need to keep an eye out for scam artists. Apparently, it's like a kind of common thing that after a storm like this, like fake arborists will pop up <laughs> and try and be like, no, 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 I'll take care of it. I'll go get the permits from the city and like charge you 200 bucks and disappear. Which I never even considered that this would be a problem. But you know, if I were to, if I were to like be at a place in my life where I thought I needed to scam someone, like being a scam arborist, I don't think would be my go-to. <laughs> I feel like that's a lot of work. No. Sophie, you went to college. You have higher scam dreams. I do. Yes. Yeah, I think you'd go white collar, and I'd be really proud of you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So this story <laughs> made me so mad. I was actually kind of sweating, John. I almost like pinged you last night. I was like, oh, like I had to turn off the heat because this is how libertarians are born, like from ridiculous, heartless, bureaucratic, like, because here's the deal. I, I don't know if you mentioned it, but they now have to pay for a reach, like a retroactive permit for their fallen tree that destroyed their house that they asked to cut before it fell down. <laughs> and the mm -hmm. city's like, hey, sorry, it fell. Anyhow, that's going to be, I don't know, 200 bucks. And uh, oh, also in seven days, you got to plant a new one or we're going to, um, you know, also fight you. What the fuck? <laughs> they also have to submit a permit for the standing Douglas fir. So this family is like, look, we're, we're really scared the second Douglas fir is going to fall. So we're, we're just going to go ahead. We're going to get an arborist to chop it down. And then if you do that without explicit city permission, you know, prior to chopping it down, you have to apply for a retroactive permit. Mm -hmm. And if the retroactive permit is, uh, it, you know, isn't approved, you can be charged up to a thousand dollars per day um, until the issue is remedied. Which I'm not sure what remedying the issue would look like after you've chopped the tree down. So it all, it, yeah, it's a little crazy. It it just doesn't make any sense. And honestly, like that makes me feel like, well, that means that the city process is not good. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like that is like a kink in that system. If, if like all of these like fallacies, like these logical things don't add up and you spoke to someone, um, Brenna Bell, mm -hmm. who I believe is the co-leader of the Shade Equity Coalition, uh, which lobbies the city to like be more aggressive in their tree planting. She's like, hey, I'm so afraid that this is going to cause like a wave of people cutting, like you said, you know, two feet saplings or whatever. But then she said, but danger comes from everywhere. You could have a door from an airplane fall on your house. You just never know. And I was like, no, <laughs> we're talking about <laughs> trees here, Brenna. We didn't have dozens of Boeing plane parts falling on homes this winter. <laughs> this was an insensitive equation. And I was like actually insulted for like everyone who lost power, housing, their fucking lives because of this actual real life danger of our lone Doug furs. And then Brenna comes in and she's like, I don't know, guys, you could get hit by a car tomorrow. Who knows? Like, no, that's not what we're talking about right here. Sorry. In her defense, I think she was saying that more in jest, which I'm not sure I like really reflected in the piece. But I think she was saying that a little bit in jest. But well, too um, soon, Brenna. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, she she absolutely has a point in that what she said came true according to what has come into my inbox of people looking at this and saying trees are bad. Oh no! And we have yeah. to chop down all the trees. So I think you know, I think there is a real concern, and I don't know what the middle ground is. Like this feels like one of those situations that's just tough, and there's not really a good solution because you can't open up the tree code too much, or people are going to take advantage of it. But you also can't have it be so stringent that like this happens. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's just kind of a it's one of those issues that just kind of sucks. Well, I just feel like it's pretty easy just to be like, all right, it's the Doug first. Let's how about we look at them? I don't know. <laughs> like, I just don't think it's that hard. <laughs> We're not saying cut them all down, but like, hey, do you have one lone hundred foot Doug fur in the back of your home not connected to any other Doug fur? Perhaps we should look at this one. I think what you said about sort of a network of roots and that Doug furs are sort of like... I mean, not that they have the agency to decide this, but they're sort of like tribal creatures. Yeah. And they do, they rely on lots of other Doug furs around them to stabilize them. So I, I think mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, I think if that's going to be a recurring issue, I absolutely think they should take another look at that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Sophie, for your reporting on that. Uh, let's take a quick break here. And when we return, more stories of the week. This 
episode is brought to you by Jinx, the superfood-powered dog kibble everyone's been talking about. See the results for yourself and try their one-month transformation. Within the first few weeks, you'll see how Jinx can help with your dog's energy, mood, and even digestion. And it's all thanks to the high-quality ingredients they use, like organic chicken, Atlantic salmon, and grass-fed beef. Try the one-month transformation today. Find Jinx in your local Walmart. What's your story this week, John? Uh, Yeah, I'm looking at a handful of programs that are trying to revitalize downtown. Um, One of them is an initiative that the city passed recently about food trucks uh, that is going to let them do business in the public right of way, right? Like, basically, you can have a food truck, it can be in a parking lot, but you haven't really been able to just sort of have it along a sidewalk because Mm -hmm. of the city code. Well, that is changing. They're starting a new permit program that's going to let food carts expand their operations and have street side vending. Um, They're going to be able to be adjacent to parks. Uh, It could be really cool. It could create way more opportunities for these mobile food trucks to be able to vend to people. Um, Another thing that I was looking at is a couple programs that have been put together to sort of provide tax incentives over the last year or so to get businesses back downtown. Uh, One is a big $25 million tax credit program that is intended to bring companies back into the central city. Uh, Mike Rogaway at The Oregonian has done some really good reporting looking at this and also an enterprise zone program um, that's sort of trying to incentivize businesses to come back into like the downtown area. I mean, there are like two things that the city is trying to find ways to bring these businesses back into the center of a city that like everyone fled during the pandemic and vacated office buildings. Um, In some cases, it looks really promising. There's a lot of criticisms as well about how this is happening. And I think it just highlights how difficult it is to sort of lure businesses back into the city center now that uh, so many people have sort of went to remote work and and fled from this downtown core. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I'm happy to hear that so many ideas are being tried out to revitalize downtown because that's the area we're really talking about. Like, here are the positives I'm hearing. Um, I'm hearing more active spaces, like because of these food carts that are now being allowed to go, mm-hmm. not just in pods, but just kind of like in other cities, you know, like they're just going to be able to like park places. Like what they were designed for, really, yeah. you know? a food truck. Yeah. <laughs> they, they have wheels. They're designed to drive on roads. Yeah. Yeah. And also a reduction in downtown's reliance on office workers, which is pretty cool, as well as attracting more and different types of businesses. But what I'm not hearing is the actual execution of the larger ideas that they're trying to do. Like Mingus said, the food truck uh, pilot program would increase the walkability of the central city plan district and decrease need for auto-oriented transportation. And I'm like, look, you're putting food trucks in places they weren't allowed to go. Like, how is that helping me get downtown or walking around downtown? That doesn't make any sense, Mingus. But not to say I don't like that. This is a great plan. We should have done it years ago, especially in parks. The fact that I always get so annoyed when I walk down Cathedral and then I'm hungry and I have to walk all the way up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Like, how cool would it be? You walk down a Cathedral and there's a few carts and there's businesses and you're like, yeah, boy, like, Mm -hmm. let's have some fun here. That's wonderful. But I'm not driving less. I don't understand understand that. And um, I know some people in downtown are like, hey, these, because they're tax breaks, essentially for property taxes. Mm-hmm. Like that's the majority of these tax breaks, that the incentives that they're talking about, right? Yeah. What, one is uh, for property taxes, the Enterprise Zone Program, which is, we could spend hours talking about, is about like uh, capital improvements, basically. So like mm-hmm. if you're bringing a bunch of industrial equipment in, or if you're like building out an office, Um, But yeah, I mean, the overarching idea of the things, at least in the Oregonian piece, is looking at like, how do we make it in the economic interest of these companies to decide to locate and like specifically in like a couple downtown neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Lower Albina, the Lloyd District, downtown Old Town, like make it more attractive to put businesses in those areas as opposed to like elsewhere in the city. Right, right. And I really love that um, the reporter of this spoke to different types of businesses because I think the smaller ones were like, hey, this is really great. I have no idea how to do any of that. Like all these are big words. (laughs) 
I have yeah. less than five people working for me. What the mm -hmm. heck is a capital? And I was like, yeah, that sucks. And these are the, this is the lifeblood of like getting these smaller businesses uh, going here. But then the larger businesses, some of them are like, oh yeah, that's great. And then there's one, I think it was, and I love this business. Is it Shadow Machine? Yeah, the animation studio. Yeah. One of their, their head of business and legal affairs was just like, this is cool, but can I just tell you what they should be doing? Perhaps cleaning up like the crap on the floor, the human feces and the holes that our uh, employees are, are, are trying to dodge getting from building to building. Like yeah. that is where maybe we should start. And so like, again, I'm hearing positive stuff like, hey, the city is doing stuff, but I could tell that there's still frustrations with like, that's great. I'm so glad I don't have to pay as much as taxes. Can we do something about the human shit on the floor? I yeah, I mean, I mean, it was and, and it was interesting, some of the criticisms that were sort of brought out as you talk to these different businesses. Another thing that the Shadow Machine team was really uh, hot on was just sort of like the regulations around uh, building out these spaces. Like what they were saying mm -hmm. is that, you know, we want to like build these like animation studios that are state of the art, but um, that the way that permitting works to get that kind of construction done, even if these incentives make it easier to like move into a space, we're going to be caught up forever trying to renovate these buildings. And that yeah. is like another big challenge, which, you know, looking back to our last piece, like those rules exist for a reason, whether it's cutting down trees or demolishing the interior of a building, but all of these rules in aggregate can just be really, really cumbersome. I think that's what frustrates me is because, you know, both of these programs, I'm in supportive and I think they're good ideas. But I think what we see is individual city commissioners kind of throwing ideas that, that sound nice and look nice, but that need to be done sort of within an ecosystem of ideas. And they're being done in, you know, isolation, like food carts that can park in the street. That's fantastic. But Claudia, like you said, how, how exactly is that going to ease transportation woes? You know, it's like the, the, they're making sort of these big claims and, exactly. and attaching it to something very small that like, you know, the, the thread is very thin there. But I think what we see is like these piecemeal ideas that really like don't have a support system around them to actually yeah. make a difference. And I think that's true for the tax breaks. I also think that's true for the food cart ideas. Again, I'm, I'm in total support of them, but I think they're just, they're too little. They're, they're just, there needs to be more. And now I'm kind of bringing politics into it, but I do think it's, it's relevant is that I think we're going to see a lot of these small ideas that they're expanding into look at my grand vision from the three city commissioners that are going to run oh, for yeah. mayor, which is Renee Gonzalez, Mingus Maps, and Carmen Rubio. You know, Carmen's mm -hmm. going really hard on the tax breaks, and Mingus is going really hard on food trucks. Renee is going really hard on public safety. You know, I think it's just going to be like, throw things at the wall. And oh, Mingus. Anyways, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. The man who brought you food trucks. Well, check this out. You were saying something about, about the support system and these lone wolves, and all I could think of them is like these three Doug Furs just swaying <laughs> in the <laughs> no. wind with no freaking root structure because they don't, like there's no working together. And also it just seems like our city is at times confused and bloated because of these like loan infrastructures, because everyone has to be like, I'm sorry, what are you doing? Um, so I can't even imagine like one city worker, commissioner, heck even our mayor, you know, they're working their asses off trying to make the city stay afloat. And I can't believe they're like, this is great. This is a great system. We're doing a great job because mm -hmm. like they don't have a smooth process. And I'm sure half of their job is just trying to do their job. And I kind of get someone being like, well, I'm going to solve you know, this thing, because it's like, yeah, buddy, you tried so hard. It actually happened. And just say all the words that you think are going to happen. But it's not. But yeah, I understand. That was your mm -hmm. intention. But guess what? You just got food trucks to like go on the side of a road. Yeah. I mean, it is an interesting design problem, right? Like, OK, we have a downtown of a city that has undergone the changes that it's gone through over the last several years for like a myriad of reasons. Um Businesses need to be able to afford to locate downtown. The spaces that are available aren't necessarily the same that businesses need. Um, to make it attractive to people to be downtown, there need to be these support businesses. But those support businesses have moved out because there's less foot traffic, because less people are downtown. And like to break that cycle is just, yeah, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to like, I feel like I'm sounding 
and maybe we're all sounding like we're sort of poo-pooing small things. And I do think change is incremental. But but I also think that we have a problem with our city leadership. And historically, we have struggled to think big, especially with this current council. I mean, I think, you know, again, we do these small things that we say are going to do really big things. But when there's not other things to sort of protect it or hold that up, I think the the change is so incremental that it's almost not useless. I don't think it's useless, but it's just it moves the needle very you know, I don't know, a centimeter. Mm -hmm. I I do think it's smart and interesting that like all of these programs are focused on the sort of core of downtown instead of being like spread across the city. I think that like targeting neighborhoods is a smart approach. Yeah, I hope it doesn't come out. Like I, whenever I'm upset at something that the way the city's working, I'm never like this person. I'm always like, man, the system, (laughs) you know, like this system is bringing us all down. And once again, I cannot wait for the charter reform. <laughs> but, I, but, and I will say though, to like any, you know, potential candidates out there listening, I would love to hear like similar programs targeting other neighborhoods as well. Yeah. You know, targeting Lentz, targeting Cully, targeting St. John's, you know, I think that like these are areas that need development just as much as downtown. Exactly. Well, um, let's talk about my story, which is something in a similar vein of incremental change to overcome a very large problem. So my story this week comes from the Portland Mercury. Their news editor, Courtney Vaughn, wrote about our city unveiling a new mobile addiction treatment program. Yeah. So it's similar to programs found in like Maryland and California, and it's going to kick off early next month. It's a special overdose response team uh, within the Portland Fire and Rescue Bureau, where they'll soon be able to start administering uh, opioid withdrawal medication. So that means that their EMTs will not only uh, be administering drugs that help ease opioid withdrawal symptoms that are like commonly used in these detox and rehab programs, they're also going to be able to enroll patients in a detox program through Central City Concern, which is like our area's gold standard soup to nuts rehab center. Like they're amazing. And I've been helping guide a lot of how the city approaches a lot of their addiction and houseless initiatives. So if you check back in on Wednesday, their CEO is actually going to be on the show and going to give us a behind the scenes, you know, on all of that. Um, But anyhow, EMTs being able to start the rehab process versus waiting for patients to like arrive in an emergency room or trusting that they'll follow up after a Narcan, you know, uh, dose is also going to take some of that pressure off from like overburdened ERs and like county clinics, which is what is also desperately needed. Um, And so this new mobile rehab thing, like this pilot is building on this larger like overdose response program that was announced earlier this month by Portland Fire and Rescue. Because right now when someone calls in an overdose, you know, all they can do, like I said, is administer Narcan. Um, But they're seeing that patient over and over and over again. It doesn't prevent or treat addiction. So the strategy will get us closer to like a goal line of sorts. And I also, I mean, I can't imagine with the volume of calls that they're getting that like these EMTs aren't having empathy fatigue. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like last year, the fire bureau responded to 7,000 OD calls and it's overwhelming our system and tying up resources. So Fire Bureau leaders are banking that this overdose response program will help streamline the way firefighters and EMTs are dispatched to all medical calls. Um, Have I mentioned how much I love firefighters and EMTs today, John? Not today, but on (laughs) Roundup's past, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So one question I had, um, the story talks a lot about buprenorphine, um, which I guess is different than like Narcan. But I don't entirely understand why. <laughs> like, do you know what the difference between what these two overdose drugs do is? No, I don't have a medical degree, but I do know that Narcan essentially restarts, like gets you out of an overdose. In my head, I'm just like, think of that like scene in Pulp Fiction, you know, like it just like gets you up from an overdose. And, I, and the other one creates a, a pathway where it actually, I think it leaves a little bit of the opioid. So you're not getting withdrawals. It, it eases you into um, rehab. Does that Got make it. sense? 
Mm -hmm. And again, this is me without a medical degree. So someone listening will be like, actually, but this is like from the reading I did of my non-medical degree uh, background. That's what I got. No, no, no. That's super. That makes a lot of sense. Like one is sort of for like you're in an overdose and you don't die. The other is like you're beginning to try and get off the drug. This helps you through withdrawals. Exactly. I think the more resources we can put out there, the more we can connect with people, you know, struggling with addiction and offer them resources, I think the better. You know, I think the issue we always come back to in Oregon, though, is lack of treatment beds. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's great if we connect people. It's great if we can revive them from a potential overdose. But, you know, when we talk about referring people to treatment, it's like, where are they going to go? Because we don't have space for them. Um, and it just seems like such a revolving door. And, and that seems to be the part that's always missing from these plans, because I think the county and the city have had decent you know, programs in the past to support people who have been struggling with addiction. But again, it comes back to where can they go for treatment mm-hmm. and when we don't have treatment bre- beds? It's just like, well, back on the street. The point is that they're going through central city concern and they're the ones who are going to manage that. But I'm just going to give you a spoiler alert. They're also saying, hey, we need more beds. <laughs> so, Well, I was going to say one of the things that we've talked about with some of the new opioid fentanyl focused treatment beds that are coming online in the city is that they need to come through a referral program, right? You can't just like show up and knock on the door and be like, help, I need you know, to go into detox treatment and like withdrawal treatment. But like, this is sort of creating a pathway for that, that there are Mm -hmm. these people who work on these mobile units that are going to uh, be able to sort of usher people into those programs. And I know they mentioned in the article, they mentioned, you know, low, low pass and the fact that the the county and the city and the state and, you know, they're all helping buy it for central city concern to open up more treatment beds. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's not a quick process. I mean, mm-hmm. if, if they're banking on that facility to be open and ready for people by the time they start this program, I mean, there's just that kind of thing takes months, if not years, to open up treatment beds. So, yeah. again, I just think there's this huge missing piece of the conversation of like, great idea, but where do these people go? Yeah. Claudia, I did sort of get curious. You'd mentioned that this has been piloted in like Maryland and California. I, I went and pulled up a, a report from Johns Hopkins University about how it went in Baltimore. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that it said is a lot of times if EMTs come and somebody has an overdose, they don't necessarily like want to go into the hospital in order to get treatment. And they said that delivering this drug uh, was associated with a six fold increase in the odds of engagement with a substance use disorder treatment, right? Just by like being able to give people that first dose of like, here is like the thing that's gonna get you onto the way of recovery, a six fold increase, which is just like, if if that's true, if that works, that's that's amazing. Yeah. I also just wanna also rain on some more good news is that the numbers have come out from Central City Concern, from the city about, hey, we're trying all these things with addiction and houselessness, and they are seeing a positive outcome. So I know there's a lot that still needs to happen, like there needs to be more shelters open like yesterday. Um, But I feel like all of this in part is working. We're getting there. We might be getting there slowly, but it's not getting worse. And that's all I need to hear. (laughs) It's like, it's not getting worse, you know? Yeah. I mean, and it's interesting to think about this in concert with all the other things that have been done over the last year or 18 months, right? Like Mm -hmm. there was a bill that was passed in the legislative session that made like fentanyl test strips like way more available and and Narcan, the anti-overdose drug more available, you know, and Mm -hmm. like uh, new detox facilities, you know, Measure 110 that is like sort of slowly providing funding for all of these things. So like as long as we don't repeal the funding for uh, treatment that Measure 110 provides, which apparently is something that Republicans are interested in doing later this year. What do you think, Sophie? Do you think we're going in a good direction? Are you thinking that maybe this isn't going to work? I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I do think we have a lot of good ideas. I think obviously as a city and state, we've just really failed to execute. And I, you know, I wish I could say I was like more hopeful about our ability to execute, but I think I need to see it before I'm convinced. And mm-hmm. you know, I don't think the drug problem is getting any easier. And I don't think we're we have fewer addicts or people falling into homelessness. Like those metrics I don't see improving. Yeah. So I guess I'm a, I'm a little skeptical. She's saying this all while she's holding her black hat who's wearing a bow tie. Hey, buddy. <laughs> He's so miserable. <laughs> so it was like, you know, it was like depressing news to hear from Sophie, who is our city reporter, you know. Um, but then it was such a cute cat that I, I took it. I took it well. <laughs> well, I'm 
optimistic. Uh, I think that things are going to fall into place because I, I think that especially with the fire bureau, what's going on right now, I feel like the emergency response is now becoming more interconnected. And it's not just the standalone bureaus. It's like everything is is coming together and they're like thinking about holistically how they respond to these types of calls. I think that's mm-hmm. that's going to put us in a, in a much better place. But I agree that ultimately we need more shelters. So uh, yeah. hopefully that's also in the in the works. Yeah. Well, thanks, you guys, um, for hanging out with me another Friday, talking through some stories. Um, thank you. What's your what's your cat's name, Sophie? Berlioz. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Berlioz. I feel for... like I have to explain that now real quick. Okay. I'll make it quick. <laughs> okay, go so, on. Um, <laughs> he's named after one of the kittens in the Aristocats. Oh, my God. Who's Berlioz. But then I was talking to someone, like, smarter and more sophisticated than me, and, I, and they were like, what's your cat's name? And I was like, Berlioz. And they were like, oh, like the really famous French composer from, like, the 1800s. And I was like... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so now you tell people. <laughs> yes. So the kitten from Aristocats was named after a French composer named Hector Berlioz. I, I got um, on Google quick. Uh, Hector Berlioz is kind of cute, too. He's got like a big floppy haircut. Does he have a bow tie on? Uh, he does not have a bow tie. He's uh-huh. got one of those like weird, like 17th century super tall neck mm. shirts on. Mm. I have to be honest. I've Googled Hector Berlioz quite a few times. I don't think he's a cute man. <laughs> He's got a cute haircut. I think he's incredibly strange looking. <laughs> well, well, we got a much better looking cat here. So we there do. We, go. we do. We do. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sophie and John. I appreciate all that you do to keep things Thanks. together for me. I appreciate it. <laughs> no problem, Claudia. Thanks. <laughs> Before we head out, I wanted to let you know that we are putting together an advice style episode and are asking for problems or dilemmas, concerns you might have, and it could be about anything really, city related or not. If you'd like our advice, hit us up at portland at citycast.fm or leave us a voicemail at 503-208-5448. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thanks so much for listening. Our executive producer is John Atariani. Our producers this week were Julia Fioni, Lizzie Goldsmith, and A.K. Al Muman. Our newsletter editor is Rachel Monahan, and our host is me, Claudia Meza. Original music by Jenny Conley and Stephen Trizos. Additional music by Epidemic Sound and All the Kimonos. We'll be back Monday morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. Mm-hmm.